In single variable calculus, when you want to have some kind of vague uh, qualitative idea of how a function behaves, it's helpful to, to have a graph of the function. You have a function of a single variable, f of x, and it gives you back a single real number, and you call that y, and you graph the pairs x, y um, that satisfies y equals f of x. Um, even without calculus, it's nice to, to have graphs. What we're going to do in this section is, is just kind of almost qualitatively, not quite, but almost qualitatively look at graphs of functions of two variables. So a real valued function of two variables. So uh, z, you'll, you'll call the output from the function. So it'll be f of x, y. You'll call the output from the function z. And we'll look at the triples x, y, z in our three um, that satisfy z equals f of x, y. Um, but we're not going to have any calculus at our disposal. Um, so we'll just kind of look at things qualitatively and look at cross sections where we fix z values or x values or y values. And then we're going to look at more general things than graphs of functions of two variables. We'll look at well um, surfaces that are defined where some equation involving x, y, and z is satisfied. So they're called level surfaces. And um, yeah, this section is mainly qualitative. Um, it's, in a way, the most amusing one for me to try to lecture about because computers can draw these graphs very nicely. And in the book, of course, you see the computer images, and it's, uh, it's I don't know, my, my graphs are going to not look nearly as nice as the ones in the book. However, when you graph, I mean, the point of doing this is so that later in the course, when you have a function, you have some, a relatively simple one, and we're trying to make a point, you have some idea of what the graph of the function looks like, and you can sketch it by hand, maybe not really well, but well enough to see the important features that we're trying to see about the function or the level surface. So um, that's what we're going to do. Let's, um, let me start by writing some of what I just said. So we, we're, you might have a function from R2 into R. So that means you give it two real numbers and it gives you back a real number. So z equals f of x, y. And we'd like to look at graphs of functions of two variables. So you know, the graph where this equation is satisfied. Graph this. In where would the graph lie? Well, you need the x, y, z triples where this equation is satisfied. So graph this in R3. Or maybe it's not just z equals f of x, y. Maybe you've got some function of x, y, and z equals, well, 0 or any constant value. But you could always move everything to the other side. So say, so. Uh, this is a level surface of F. So something like, oh, well maybe z squared minus x squared minus y squared equals 0. As I said, you could put any constant over here. If I put equals 7 over here, well, then I could have written that. Well, if I write equals 7. Well, I can write that as some function of x, y, and z equals 0 just by subtracting 7 from both sides and writing this. Um, so we're going to look at where functions of three variables are equal to 0 or other constants. Um, it doesn't have to be written in this form. You could put some of this stuff on the other side, like z, squ or z squared equals x squared plus y squared plus 7. Yeah, so I mean, this is a nice way of writing it. We still call that a level surface of a function um, where you think of everything being put on one side and equaling a constant, or, or specifically the constant 0. In fact, graphs of functions of two variables, where you call the output z, are also level surfaces. Like This is more general. We can have a z squared. But you can write this equation as the level surface. You just define as a level surface. You define f of x, y, z to be z minus f of x, y. And then where f of x, y, z equals 0, well, that's the same as saying z minus f of x, y is 0. That's 
if and only if z equals f of xy. So looking at the things that, as level surfaces is more general than looking at graphs. So and we'll, do, we'll do both. Um, we've actually looked at level surfaces already in a very special case. <clears throat> we already saw If you take AX plus BY plus CZ plus D equals zero, where not all of A, B, and C are zero. So A, A B, C, and D are constants. These, we don't want all of these, not all zero. One or, more, one or two of them could be zero, but not all of them. We saw that this defines a plane. So planes are an example of level surfaces, but we've already looked at those when we graph lines and planes, so I'm not going to concentrate on those at all. But we did look at those. Let's try, let's look at an example that's a graph of a function of, well, say a function of two variables, but it won't really look like it. Let's look at z equals f of xy, and the function is just x squared. Now, you have to be a little, or substantially careful here. I was going to say a little careful, but you could just write z equals x squared. But then it has to be clear you're looking at this in three dimensions, right? Writing f of xy equals x squared makes it clear, oh yeah, well there is a y variable, there are just no conditions on it, it doesn't appear in the function. Um, but you know, you know the variable is there. If you just write this, you need to tell somebody you're looking at the graph in R3 um, because you only see two, variable, two variables. You might think, oh, you want to know what the graph of that looks like in the xz plane. But no, if you write this, it's clear that we want this in all of space um, where you have a y-coordinate to worry about. So, um, what does the graph of that look like when one of the variables is missing? You might think, oh, that means, uh, sometimes people think, oh, that variable must be zero. No. No. Understand, that equation is defining the set of points x, y, z. Right? So we're looking at the graph of z equals x squared in R3. And saying that this defines a surface, or what it's, what graph does this correspond to? It's we look at the triples x, y, z, such that, well, it means precisely that we're looking at one such that z equals x squared. There's no restriction on y, so it's not that it's fixed at zero or something like that. It gets to be anything. Um, so, what do you get? Well. So suppose we look at all those triples where y is 0. So if you look at where y is 0, so we call this the y equals 0 cross-section. A cross-section is what you get when you fix the values of one of the variables. The y equals 0 cross-section, well then you just get, well you get y equals 0, and you get the curve z equals x squared. Now we know that's a parabola. So you take the y-axis, and y equals 0 is the xz plane. So, and you draw a parabola, the parabola z equals x squared, inside the xz plane. Now we have to try to draw this in perspective. So you're supposed to be picturing a parabola that's turned a little bit because it's supposed to be sitting in the xz plane. So this is supposed to be the parabola z equals x squared but in perspective, where it's sitting in the xz plane, all right, well, what do you get inside the y equals 1 cross-section? Well, you get the same parabola, but now it's sitting inside the plane where y equals 1. So if you draw y equals 1 out here somewhere, then that parabola, it looks just like that one, except translated over here, 
to where y equals 1. And that's what you get in every fixed y cross-section. You get the same parabola. It should look the same. So what does that mean you get? You get this, so now let me change my graph and actually let me switch to a different color. So what you end up with is So what you're supposed to picture is the parabola z equals x squared and you just kind of extend it parallel to the y-axis. So in every y cross-section you get the same parabola z equals x squared. Um, so that's what you get when you do this. Hopefully this isn't a terrible example. It keeps going in both directions. Um, we give a we give a name to something like this where it's you take a curve and you extend it parallel to a line. So here we're taking z equals x squared. We're taking that parabola and we're extending it parallel to the y-axis. This is called a general cylinder. So you're a general cylinder. You may think that doesn't look like any cylinder I've ever seen. Well, it's a general cylinder where cylinder has the meaning you take a curve in a plane and then you extend that curve parallel to a given line. So this one is a parabola in each cross section, in each y cross section. So a lot of people would call this uh, parabolic to indicate that the cross section is perpendicular to the axis you're extending parallel to, or the line you're extending parallel to the cross sections or parabolas. So this is called a parabolic cylinder. How often will parabolic cylinders come up in multivariable calculus? It you know, just depends, but the real point of this example is if one of your variables is missing, it's not that it has a fixed value, it's that it gets to be anything, and you'll always get a cylinder. You sketch, you sketch your curve in whichever, you know, if you look at the missing variable. It's like y. So sketch the curve in one of the y cross sections, like y equals zero, and then you just extend parallel to that axis, the, the plane curve that you've drawn. So I mean, let's look at, for instance, the most, what you normally think of as a, a cylinder. Let's look at So we could look at x squared plus y squared equals 4, but in R3. Um, as I said, if you just wrote x squared plus y squared equals 4, I would think you meant a circle in the xy plane. You'd think I meant a circle in the xy plane. Almost everybody would think you meant a circle centered at the origin in the xy plane. If you mean that it defines something in R3, you need to say it when one of the variables is missing because it's, it's not clear at all. But in R3, what's happening is, again, there's no restriction on the z coordinate. So what you do is you draw the curve that you get when you fix one z value. So you look at a z cross section. So let's look at the z equals zero cross section where we fixed one value of z. What do you get when z is 0 and x squared plus y squared equals 4? Well, you get a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. So now I'm going to draw a circle in perspective, but that means it'll look like an ellipse. Because right? it's supposed to be in perspective. <laughs> Alright, so that's supposed to be a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin in the xy plane, but then z gets to be anything. And in every z cross section, you see the same circle of radius 2 centered at, well, the origin in that copy of the xy plane. So up here, like maybe if you pick, if you fix where z equals 2, which defines a plane, then inside that plane at z equals 2, you also see, oh, x squared plus y squared equals 4. You see 
the circle of radius 2, centered at the origin. And that's what you see at every z-coordinate. So what you get is what you normally think of as a cylinder, where the z-value gets to, to be anything, and every z-cross-section is the same circle. The same, but in, at different z-values. So this, you probably know the technical term for this is a right, a right circular cylinder. Cylinder, because it's extended parallel to the z-axis. You took a curve in the xy plane and you extended it parallel to the z-axis. The right means that the axis was parallel to the plane that the curve was in, so it makes a right angle. And circular is because the cross sections are all circles. So a right circular cylinder, which is what you normally think of as a cylinder. All right, what other kinds of surfaces do we want to look at? I'm going to look at what's known as quadric surfaces or what are known as quadric surfaces. These are um, simple enough that we can kind of sketch them and the equations for them look relatively simple and yet they display enough interesting features that it's a nice collection of examples to have at our disposal. Um, I guess I should say what a quadric surface is. It's something defined by a single equation that's a polynomial, that where a polynomial, well, a level surface of a polynomial of two variables that has degree two. What does this mean? We're going to look at quadric surfaces. So graphs of, all right, <clears throat> you can have constants times x squared times y squared times z squared. Other degree two terms would be x times y, y times z, x times z. So a d times xy plus an e times xz plus an f times yz. And then you could have some linear terms uh, plus h times y plus i times z k equals zero, where a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, and j are all constants. And to be quadric, you mean that the degree really is two, so that not all of a through f are zero, because if all of a through f are zero, then this would just define a plane, assuming that g, h, and i aren't all zero. So <clears throat> not all of a, b, c, D, E, and F are zero. So that you have a, a degree two term, either an x squared, a y squared, a z squared, or an x times y, an x times z, or y times z. Um, this allows, <clears throat> this is the most general type of quadric surface. In fact, what we're going to look at are ones in kind of special standard forms which mean we think of them as centered at zero, although centered doesn't really mean much. Kind of, in some way, they're special at the origin. Um, and yeah, it'll give us enough. And we will, I will briefly mention how to manipulate them in small ways. So let's start with one that's not so bad. So let's start with z equals x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. All right. How do you get any idea of what, of what this looks like? Well, the graph of this. So, well, one way is to look at all of the cross sections. And in fact, so look at z cross sections, look at x cross sections, look at y cross sections. So you know, this one, this really is the graph of a function of two variables. It's just z equals some function of x and y. Um, it's, uh, the z cross sections are also called um, level sets of f. So where f equals a fixed value, a level set in general is where a function equals 
a fixed, a constant value. So I talked about a level surface of a function of three variables. Now if we fix a z, we get a level curve of a function of two variables. So for instance, so what are the z, but I'll just call them z cross sections, but understand they're also level sets of f. A z, the z cross sections, what happens? Well, if z is negative, you don't get anything. There are no triples that satisfy this where z is negative because x squared is greater than or equal to 0, y squared is greater than or equal to 0, so this side is greater than or equal to 0. So if z is 0, you get nothing. <clears throat> you get nothing. If z equals 0, when z equals 0, you'd have something greater than or equal to 0 plus something greater than or equal to 0 equals 0 then both of these better be zero, which means x and y are zero. So you don't really get a level curve, you get a single point. So when z is zero, x and the z equals zero cross section is the single point, x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero, the origin. But if z is greater than zero, like think one, what do you get? Well, you should know this from high school x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals a constant. It's an, a constant that's greater than 0. That defines an ellipse. For instance, if, if z is 1, you get kind of the standard equation for an ellipse. 1 equals x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9, which hopefully you remember, means that your x-coordinate goes between minus 2 and 2. This is centered at 0. Your y-coordinate goes between minus 3 and 3. I'm taking the square roots of those. Minus 3 and 3, and it's shaped like that. As z increases, the, um, the relative size of the, of the minor and major axis stays the same. So the shape looks the same, it just gets bigger as z expands. This is almost enough to draw what this looks like, what this graph looks like. You try to draw ellipses um, that go between minus 2 and 2. Well, <laughs> I don't know what I'm drawing. When, when z is 0, you get a single point. After that, you want cross sections that look like ellipses, I'm going to try to draw the one at z equals 1, that goes between um, x is minus 2 and 2. Of course, in perspective, it'll look like kind of any ellipse or look like a circle, even, in perspective. But I'm trying to draw it so it looks longer than it, longer this way on, on the y-axis than it is wide. And then it just comes up from this and gets bigger. It's this bowl-shaped thing, but every cross-section is some ellipse that goes farther out on the y-axis than on the x-axis. Um, this is called, and now I have to tell you why it's called this. So if I fix z, I get ellipses. What are the x and y cross-sections? If I fix an x-value, I get z equals a constant plus y squared. Well, that defines a parabola. If I fix um, y, I get z equals x squared plus a constant. Well, that defines a parabola in that fixed y cross-section. So if you fix x values, you get parabolas. So if you look at x cross-sections, you get parabolas. If you look at y cross-sections, you get parabolas. In my picture, those would be, in my sketch, those would be right there. There's a y cross-section. You fix a y value, you get a parabola where it's harder for me to draw the x ones because of the way I've got my picture drawn, so I won't, but um, an x cross-section, you also get parabolas. Um, but the z cross-sections are ellipses. So because two of the cross-sections are parabolas, two of the sets of cross-sections are parabolas, we call this a paraboloid. A paraboloid. But because the remaining one gives you ellipses, we call this an elliptical paraboloid. An elliptical paraboloid. 
does it really look like this? Um, yes, or vaguely, anyway. I want to say, yeah, I, I drew this after just saying that the cross sections were, were, uh, were ellipses that were getting bigger. Also, notice that when z is negative, we get nothing. When z is zero, we get a point. And then we get ellipses that are getting bigger. But how do you know it has this kind of edge? Well, if you think about it, that edge that I've got drawn is essentially exactly the x equals zero cross section. It's turned a little differently, but it looks like it's where x is zero. Well, that means that that edge that I've got drawn is where x is zero and z equals y squared over nine. That's a parabola. So, you know, you could draw this edge, z equals y squared over 9, and then put in ellipses that are longer in the y direction than in the x direction, and that's as good as you need for your graphs to be. Um, you can see that you know, this is as small as it gets at 0, it gets bigger. You know, in some sense, this is concave up. These are the features that we're going to look at later. Um, if you wanted, you know, we think of this as centered at the origin, you know, it's not exactly, I don't know, centered doesn't seem to be the right term, but something special happens at the origin. Um, if you want to manipulate this equation, for instance, suppose you wanted it centered, so you want the vertex someplace besides at the origin. Well, that's easy to do. If I just replace z by z minus 1 and our uh, you see, if I want to agree with the book, if I want to agree with the book, I wrote z minus 3, x minus 1 squared over 4 plus y minus 2 squared over 9. So I've, I've replaced x by the quantity x minus 1, y by the quantity y minus 2 and z by the quantity z minus 3. Where does that move the origin? Um, you might think, oh, it subtracts 1 from the x-coordinate, subtracts 1 from the y-coordinate, and subtracts 1 from the z-coordinate. No, those are subtracted in the equation. So to get the corresponding point, you actually have to add. You have to add those values, 1, 2, and 3. For instance, up here, when is this 0? Well, that happens when x is 0. When is this 0? when x is 1, not minus 1. So this is now centered, and I'll put that in quotes, centered at, no longer at 0, 0, 0, it's centered at 1, 2, 3. Um, really, we shouldn't talk about centered, we should talk about the, the vertex. So you, know, you can just skip the term center, right? The vertex is at. So all it's done is shift this up. In fact, it's easier for me to move my axes. But it shifted this, and I guess I will, but it shifted this up to where this point is now 1, 2, 3. The vertex and your axes are down here somewhere. I think of this height is 3. And when you drop this into the xy plane, the x coordinates 1 and the y coordinates 2. So yeah, that just moves the, the vertex, or you can think centered, but you, know, it's kind of, you need to be careful. What if you wanted to turn this upside down? That's easy too, just negate. So I'm just telling you about easy manipulations. Let's go back to z equals x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. Great. Well, what if you wanted to turn it upside down? Well, just negate it. Negate all the, negate this side, which means you negate the z coordinates. Well, that graph then would look like this. It's still an elliptical paraboloid. The, Shapes of the ellipses are the same, but now when, you, when z is positive, you get nothing. When z is 0, you still get the origin. And when z is negative, you get ellipses that have the same shape that we had before. What if you wanted to turn it upside down like this, but have the vertex be where z is positive? Just add some z value, like 
z equals 4 minus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9. Then that would raise that graph 4 units. You added 4 to the z coordinates. So now you'd have 4 is up here. So it's still an elliptical paraboloid. It curves downward. Um, its vertex is now at 0, 0, 4. Um, but, yeah, it's really no more difficult than what we started with. I mean, than our original, so, yeah, what we started with. All right, let's look at Let's look at some more quadric surfaces. So I want to look at, next I want to look at <laughs> basically footballs. So I want to look at x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared plus z squared over c squared equals 1. You should think of this as the three-dimensional analog. So in three dimensions, it defines a surface in three dimensions. You almost certainly looked at, and we just did, looked at ellipses in the xy plane defined by this. And you, this was a standard form. It's centered at the origin. The A and B tell you how far you are positive numbers that tell you how far out you go on the x-axis on the y-axis. With pluses here, it's the same thing. This is, so it's I said football, but <laughs> so it just drew this quickly. It doesn't look very symmetric, but it should. Maybe I should cut it off more here. As I said, this section is kind of the funniest one for me to do in a lecture because computers can draw this so much better than I can. But understand, you only need to draw it as well as I do because you're just supposed to be getting an idea of some of the qualitative features. So what happens here? It's, what are the z cross-sections? Well, as long as the absolute value of z is less than c, so a, b, and c are all positive here. As long as the absolute value of z is less than c, this is less than 1, and you get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals, you can put this over here, equals some positive number. So as long as z is less, has absolute value less than c, you get uh, an ellipse. But as z gets closer and closer to having absolute value c, this gets closer and closer to 1, and so you get closer and closer to x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 0, which is a single point. So what's happening? Oh, you get ellipses if your z coordinate is between minus c and c, but you can do the same kind of analysis for the so those were z cross-sections. You can do the same analysis for the x and y cross-sections. You get ellipses for all of those until you get a single point when the absolute value of the variable equals a, b, or c. So the x-coordinate goes between a and minus a. Uh, that's, that's the y-coordinate. The x-coordinate goes between a and minus a. The y-coordinate goes between minus b and b. And the z-coordinate goes between minus c and c. And all of the cross-sections are ellipses until you're out at one of these extreme vertices. And then you get a single point. Once you go beyond that, the cross-section's empty. You get nothing. So um, all of the cross-sections are ellipses, except for the special values where you get points or nothing. So we just call this an ellipsoid. And it really is centered at the origin. All right, ellipsoids are, are fairly easy. What's important here is that it's plus this, plus this, plus this. They're all squared, and it equals 1. If you have some minuses or one of them's not squared, it changes things completely. So for instance, 
Let's look at Let's look at z squared equals x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. Now, I could put the z squared on the other side if I wanted it's the same as x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared minus z squared equals zero. If this were a plus z squared, this would define a point because then we'd have three things that are all greater than or equal to zero adding up to zero. that all have to be zero. We'd just get x equals y equals z equals zero. But I said a second ago, a few minutes ago that what's important is where the pluses and minuses are and which things are squared. What do you get here? Well, let's look at the z cross sections. Once again, as you fix a z, for a fixed z um, other than zero, when z is positive, you get ellipses. We've seen that, and they get bigger as z gets bigger. When z is negative, because of the square, z squared will be positive, and you'll still get ellipses. And they'll get bigger as the absolute value of z gets bigger. So um, when z is 0, you get a single point. So you get a single point, so z equals 0. You get x equals y equals 0. z unequal to 0, you get ellipses. which get bigger. As the absolute value of z gets bigger. That, that's because that makes z squared get bigger. Um, now, considering that we already had um, an elliptical paraboloid, and so the cr z cross sections were ellipses there, and, the, and then you get parabolas for the other two sets of cross sections, you might think, oh, this is some kind of, you might think, so let me put a big question mark here, some question marks here, because um, this isn't going to be right, but you might think, oh, okay, I get like the elliptical paraboloid we had before, but I get the same thing for negative z because of the squared, and so it looks like kind of two elliptical paraboloids crammed together. That is not an unreasonable thing to expect at this point because we've only looked at the z cross sections. This would have the features that we've mentioned, that when z is zero, you just get a single point. As z gets bigger and positive, you get ellipses that are getting bigger. As z gets negative, and gets bigger in absolute value, you get bigger and bigger ellipses. That would satisfy this, but remember what I said before. How do you know what the edge looks like, like this edge that I've got drawn? That's essentially where y is zero. And when we just had a z, not a z squared, where, uh, sorry, that's essentially where x is zero. When we just had a z, not a z squared, and we said x equals zero, we got z equals y squared over b squared. It's a parabola, and we graph that. But now we have z squared. So this edge that's essentially in the plane, where in the yz plane, where x is 0, what are you seeing for the edge? The edge where x is 0 is z squared, is defined by z squared equals y squared over b squared. But this is the same as z equals plus or minus y over b. Well, z equals positive y over b is a line, defines a line through the origin with slope 1 over b in the yz plane. And you get another line, z equals minus y over b. So the cross section is two lines, both through the origin with slopes 1 over b and minus 1 over b. The graph doesn't look like that. It looks like two lines. Think, think two lines in the yz plane. One with positive slope, one with negative slope, and then you draw ellipses for the cross sections. Oh, so in a sense it looks like that double elliptical paraboloid, except the edges are straight. So 
That looks like a cone. This looks like a cone. Actually, this two-sided thing is what we call a cone. Or this two this thing with two, two, what you'd normally think of as cones. Like you'd never see an ice cream cone that has a top part and a bottom part like this. But for a mathematician, this is a cone. Or if you really want to emphasize that it has two pieces, you can call it a double cone. But if we say cone, that's what we mean. Um, if we just meant the top half, we would refer to a half cone. Um, so this defines a cone. And you can, of course, take square roots here and get, so z is plus or minus the square root of x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. And then the top half of that cone, including the origin, is where z equals plus the square root. And the, the bottom half, including the origin, is where z equals minus the square root. Um, so yeah, this gives you a cone, a, a double cone. Um, all right, let's look at another example. So again, we're going to have a graph of a function of two variables. So we'll just have z equals something. This one will be will definitely be important to us throughout the rest of the course. Let's look at z equals x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared. All right. And just to look at a particular one, let's just pick a and b to be 1. So we'll look at this. Qualitatively, I would draw this one exactly like I'd draw this one. So let me put in the specific numbers 1 and 1 so that it's easier for me to talk about it. Um, what do you get? All right. <laughs> so when you fix an x value, so you take an x cross section, you get y equal, z equals a constant minus y squared. That's a parabola. When you take a y cross section, you get z equals x squared minus a constant. That's a parabola. Two of the cross sections are, are parabolas. So um, we're going to call this a paraboloid. Um, but when you fix a z value, unlike when we had x squared plus y squared and had two of the sections, two of the sets of cross sections were parabolas, and then the z cross section with a plus there were ellipses, um, or here would be circles if that were a plus. Now, because we've got this minus sign, if we pick z unequal to zero, then we get hyperbolas for the cross sections. So this defines so two. Two sets of the cross sections are parabolas, but the third one, instead of being ellipses, the third set are hyperbolas. This defines a hyperbolic paraboloid, which just sounds kind of cool. Hyperbolic paraboloid. So I'm going to draw it and then discuss what I've drawn. It's um, I always draw these in the same way, and then I move the axes to match what, I, what I've drawn if I have to. So here's how I recommend drawing it. You draw a hyperbola in perspective in the, at a fixed z coordinate. So I'm thinking of this as a hyperbola in some z equals something slice. So in a z equals something cross section, I draw a hyperbola. Then I'm going to draw kind of the edge, like where I'm thinking of x being 0, except it, here that won't be right. But I'm going to draw a parabola connecting these vertices. Actually, I don't want to go down too far because I have to draw a lot more. And then you want to draw a hyperbola that opens along a different direction. So we're going to put kind of one of the axes parallel to this. And the z-axis will be up and down. And in perspective, the other axis, x or y, will be like this. And what we need to draw, or maybe coming straight out at us would be an easier way to think of it, is a hyperbola. This one opens up along whatever this axis is. We need a hyperbola that opens up along the other axis, which I'm going to draw almost perpendicular to this one. So at a, at a lower z-coordinate, I'm picking one lower than than the vertex of this parabola. So here, this is supposed to be 
a, para, uh, a hyperbola that opens along the other axis or parallel to the other axis. And I've got it drawn much wider. And then I connect these. Let me erase. Connect this with this. Connect this with this. And connect this with this. Um, and then finally, I want to draw a parabola connecting these vertices, like I drew this one, but this one will have to curve downward. So I'm going to draw in a different color and a parabola that connects those. Maybe I'll do this one in yellow too. So this is how I always draw <laughs> hyperbolic paraboloids, um, just because that's the easiest for me. Let me, maybe I'll shade these hyperbolas in pink. This is a hyperbolic paraboloid. If you think, oh, it kind of looks like a saddle, like you'd sit on it. Yeah, it's also called that. A lot of people just refer to this as a saddle. The technical term, a saddle doesn't sound as cool as the phrase hyperbolic paraboloid, but yeah, it's kind of more informative. It looks like a saddle. This is how I always draw hyperbolic paraboloids. Um, and what we want to see is how it matches with this equation. So um, the cross sections, if you fix different z values, you should get hyperbolas. We see one hyperbola here, and as you move down, you get smaller hyper hyperbolas that are moving downward. I should say smaller. You get hyperbolas that are moving downward until you get down to z equals zero. When z equals zero, you get x zero equals x squared minus y squared. Well, that's x squared equals y squared. That's x equals plus or minus y. There you get two lines. And those lines aren't particularly easy to see in the graph, but I can draw them in. They come in like right here. And for z smaller than that, for z negative, you still get hyperbolas, but now they open up along uh, a different axis. So, um, when x is 0, you get a parabola that curves downward because of the minus sign. When y is 0, you get a parabola that curves upward because of the, of the plus sign. Right? When y is 0, you get z equals x squared. So <laughs> what I said is I always draw my hyperbolic paraboloids the same way, and then I put the axes where they belong. So normally, I would draw, so here's the z-axis. This is definitely the origin. And then I've got one axis here and one axis along here. And normally, or one axis along here. Normally, I pick this to be the positive x, that to be the positive y, and this is positive z. Is that right for that equation? Well. This, if this were the x-axis, then when x is 0, I should see a parabola that curves upward. No, that's wrong. So this better not be the positive x-axis. Um, it could be the positive y-axis. So you can do that. Um, can you make this, then, the positive x-axis? You can. It would be kind of a bad choice because... We like to draw right-handed coordinate systems. That means if x is in, you want x, y, z to be a right-handed triple. So if you point your index finger in the direction of the x coordinate and your middle finger in the direction of the, y, of the positive y coordinate, your thumb should point in the direction of the positive z axis. No, it doesn't. So um, either you have to tell yourself, I'm happy with a left-handed coordinate system, and then you can keep this one, or you need to reverse one of these axes. So you know, instead of the positive x there, you could pick the positive x-axis is along here. That would be fine. So then positive x, positive y, positive z. Or you could negate the z-axis, or you could make this the negative y-axis. But For me, it's easiest to draw the hyperbolic paraboloid the same way every time and then put in the axes 
than to try to put my axes in and, and sketch it well. Um, right, the, but if it's easier for you the other way, go ahead. Um, certainly the computer has no problem with it in any orientation. Um, what are important features for you to see here? Yeah, the Z cross sections are hyperbolas, except when Z is zero. The X cross sections are parabolas that curve downward. So when you fix an X value, you get parabolas that curve downward. Getting a lot of colors in here now. You get parabolas that curve downward. The, the, um, the Y cross sections, so like where Y is zero, you get parabolas that curve upward. They're harder for me to put more of in the picture. Well, a little harder. You get parabolas that curve upward. Um, when z is zero, you get two lines. Um, yeah, and later what's going to be important to us is there's not a local maximum or a local minimum occurring here in some directions, like in the in the y equals zero cross section, uh, you get a low you get a global minimum here. This is as small as you can be in the y equals zero cross section. On the other hand, it's as big as you can be because this parabola curves downward, it's as big as you can be in the x equals zero cross section. So in some directions you get a, a minimum here and in some directions you get a maximum later that's going to be very important to us. We like, uh, saddles are very interesting because of, in calculus because of that. Um, all right. I want, we need to look at two more. So let's look at x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals z squared over c squared. All right, if I left it like that, you should know I could multiply through by c squared, and this would be our, our, a cone for us. Um, and it would look like a cone, or it would be. A, it would define a double cone. But I want to add one. What, you know, what, how does that change things? Well, now there's no cone point where things come together. The, your z cross section, the smallest this side ever gets is when z is zero, but that doesn't give you x squared plus y squared equals zero. It doesn't give you a single point. When z is zero, you get one over here, so you get an ellipse. So what you get for the z cross sections when z equals zero, when z is anything, equals any, I uh, don't want to write C, it equals anything, because this is squared plus one, this side's always positive, and you always get an ellipse. And the ellipses get bigger as the absolute value of C, Z gets bigger. When Z gets bigger and positive, this gets bigger. If Z is negative, it gets bigger in absolute value, this gets bigger, and it's symmetric between plus and minus Z. So, um, what do you get in the, for the x and y cross sections? Like if you fix x is zero. If you fix x is zero, you get y squared over b squared minus z squared over c squared equals one. Actually, let me write this. I'm just going to look at the x equals zero cross section. Um, when x is zero, you get y squared over b squared equals this, but if I subtract this part, you get equals one. Well, that's a hyperbola. Right? Something squared over b squared minus something that defines a hyperbola. When y equals zero, you get x squared over a squared minus z squared over c squared equals one. That's a hyperbola. So that, and for small values of x, um, you continue to get hyperbolas. For small values of y, you continue to get hyperbolas until x reaches absolute value a, has absolute value a y has absolute value b, then, so two out of three of the sets of the cross sections are called hyperbola, are hyperbolas, so this is called a hyperboloid. Um, we don't bother or qualifying it by saying 
uh, an elliptical hyperboloid, but we do say a hyperboloid of one sheet, and I'll explain that in a minute. But what do you get? Um, you get hyperbolas. This one open, these can open along the y-axis, these open along the x-axis. Um, and in any z-coordinate, you're getting an ellipse, so you kind of you know, draw the, the edge hyperbolas, and then draw your ellipses, increasing in size. This is a hyperboloid. Hyperboloid. Of one sheet. It's called of one sheet because it's in one piece. Um, so you're thinking of it as a sheet. You think of it as a sheet of rubber that's been stretched in that shape. Um, we wouldn't bother calling it a hyperboloid of one sheet if there weren't hyperboloids of two sheets. But there are hyperboloids of two sheets. What, how do you get a hyperboloid of two sheets? Well, you put in a minus sign somewhere. Where? Well, right over there on the one. X squared over A squared um, plus Y squared over B squared again equals z squared over c squared, but now minus 1. What does that give you? All right. I'm going to go ahead. I, I already said it, so I'm going to go ahead and write. This is going to be a hyperboloid, but of two sheets. No, there's none of three sheets. What does it look like? All right, let's look at the z cross sections. So when z is 0, you get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals minus 1 when z is 0. That never happens. This side's greater than or equal to 0. Um, you can't equal something negative. So when z is 0, you get nothing. In fact, as long as this side is negative, you get nothing in the z equals whatever cross section. Well, that will be negative if z has absolute value less than c. So if the absolute value of z is less than c, then z squared is less than c squared. This is less than 1, and this side will be negative. Uh, you get nothing. So no part of the graph, there's no part to this graph where the absolute value of z is less than c. So that's for z between minus c and c. A, uh, a b, and c are positive. So you get nothing between minus c and c. So, get so here's c, here's minus c, and there's no part of the graph there. If the absolute value of z is c, i.e. z is plus or minus c, then this, this is 1 minus 1. You get 0. You get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 0. That means x equals 0 and y equals 0. That's, you get these two points. When z is c and x and y is 0, and when z is minus c and x and y are 0. Then what happens above that? Well, it's symmetric. The same thing happens for positive z's. It happens for negative z's. When z is above that, you start getting ellipses. When z is bigger, you start getting ellipses. So, um, And they get bigger as he gets bigger up for positive z. And you should get the symmetric thing, which I'm trying to draw symmetrically. Down here when z is negative, the cross sections are ellipses that are getting bigger. Um, what's this edge that I've got drawn? Again, you're seeing kind of where x is 0. Well, that if x is 0, that edge would be this edge that I'm drawing the ellipses between should be where y squared over b squared equals z squared over c squared minus 1. If you put the 1 over there and the y over there, you get, oh, that's 1 equals z squared over c squared minus y squared over b squared. That's an ellipse that opens up along the z-axis. So that's what we've got. Here's inside the y equals 0 cross section. Uh, did I say ellipse? I don't know what I... It's a hyperbola. 
<laughs> that opens up along the z-axis. Right? You, you were looking at where x is 0, and then, yeah, this will curve along, it will hit the z-axis when z is c, and when z is minus c, and um, kind of opens up along the z-axis. Um, the cross-sections where, you know, where y is 0, again, you get you get hyperbolas, which I'll actually call hyperbolas this time. So if you fix x's, you get hyperbolas. If you fix y's, you get hyperbolas. So that's why it's a hyperboloid. But it's in, the graph is in two pieces. You get nothing for z values in here. And so it's called a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, that's the last of the quadric surfaces. How well do you need to be able to draw these things? <laughs> Only as well as I did. You want to see qualitative features. Um, the, the hyperbolic paraboloid, so the saddle, is, uh, is one of the things we'll care about the most that's the hardest to draw. It's, um, you know, the, for a lot of our purposes, we'll care about elliptical paraboloids because they kind of give us primary examples, canonical examples of where maximum values occur and canonical examples of where minimum values occur. But saddles, the hyperbolic paraboloids, will also be incredibly important to us because it's an example where, yeah, as I said before, where something's happening at that saddle point. Um, but it, you're not getting a local maximum or a local minimum value of the function. In some directions, it's a local minimum, and in some directions, it's a local maximum. And we need to investigate that kind of behavior. So um, this is a nice collection of examples of graphs for us to have at our disposal throughout the, throughout the rest of the textbook. So that's about as well as I can draw them, too.